So the explosion of economic activity we're going to see in this coming century is massive. And some of it, just because of the mechanics of how China, Germany, and Russia are failing, is going to be front-loaded. The Ukraine war means that the German industrial model is dying. The Ukraine war plus demographics plus mismanagement means the Chinese model is dying. And Russia, even if they win, is basically fencing itself off from the world. That's a world where the United States is the only power that matters. That's a world in which the United States needs to double the size of its industrial plant just to make the goods that the population has become accustomed to. That will generate the fastest economic growth we have ever seen. And on the backside of that transition period, our supply chains will be local. They'll be closer to their consumers. They'll have fewer steps. They'll be harder to disrupt. They'll be broadly immune to things that happen in the Eastern Hemisphere. It will employ people that are from this continent and serve people who are from this continent. We finally get to where we would have been probably in 1950 if the world wars had not happened. And that is the start of an American century. Oh, well, one of the beautiful things about geography is it does not change very quickly. I mean, you're talking under normal circumstances, thousands of years to have an evolution in something that would make a meaningful difference. So history is just events playing off across the same geography, often in the same way, it's just in different eras with different personalities. Uh, so once you figure out, you know, the, the mechanics of a region, like how the mountains and the plains and the rivers and the oceans interplay to create the entity that is there, the culture that is there, you can then dial back through history till you'll, till you'll get to the beginning. Uh, and one of the things I enjoy most, and I try to make this core to most of my work, it's telling the story from the very beginning, like, you know, pre-industrial, not just pre-industrial, but pre-sedentary agriculture, to see how, as the technology evolves, our relationship with our geography changes. The geography doesn't change. Our relationship changes because all of a sudden we have a new tool. So sedentary agriculture gave rise to certain types of civilizations that then ruled their worlds for not centuries, but millennia. But in time, that gave way to advances in metals, which shifted the geographies that were successful somewhere else. Industrialization and deep water navigation did the same things. And so the story replays, but kind of with a new player. And I just find that entire process fascinating. And a lot of what the book is, is showing how through these technological ages, we got to where we are. Globalization made a dramatic transformation and deglobalization puts us back in a world where the interplay with technology and geography will once again determine much of the human condition. And we're, we're already knee deep in that transition. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we're going to have a lot more of that. So the very concept of mercantilism is that you try to keep the sensitive parts of your economy, not just insulated from everybody else. You deliberately overproduce and then product dump on captive markets, both to generate the income that you were after, as well as to destroy potential competition in the future. So, for example, um, in the early industrial age, the Brits had industrialized, the Germans had not. The Germans had the most productive guild manufacturing, but they hadn't industrialized. So the Brits would dump their surplus products, things like textiles, on the German market and basically cause a deflationary collapse within the local economy. Uh, I expect we will see a lot of that from the parts of the world that are more successful moving forward. Uh, unfortunately, the last time the United States did this, we called it dollar diplomacy and it generated a lot of political uh, destruction in China and earned us a lot of angst and anger throughout Latin America that still exists today. I'm hoping we'll be a little bit less of a prick about it this next time, but I can see the Japanese doing the same thing. The French will absolutely do the same thing. Uh, the UN was only, well, sorry, the use of UN was useful in two ways. Number one, there's a lot of minutia that needed to be taken care of in order to manage the globalized system, things like mail and international standards. And for that, the UN was actually pretty good. Um, second, it kept great power competition uh, it, it kept the players talking, and in a bipolar world between the Soviets and the Americans, it was useful to force certain conversations into the open. 
Uh, so we need sort of a concert of powers negotiating forum. Uh, the only one of those we have at the moment is the G7. And those are countries that for most topics are broadly on the same side. Uh, we are not going to get a functional successor until the world has settled a little bit. So you're talking about at least 10 years from now when we can see who's going to be around when the dust settles, uh, when the Germans and the Chinese and the Russians are no longer available to play those kinds of roles. I have a difficult time imagining what that court sort of structure would look like because everything else is going to be defined by the relationship with the United States. And the United States probably is not going to see a huge benefit for building an institution that would be expressly designed to limit American options. It would be easier for us to just handle everything within our own institutions and bilateral talks. And I think that most of the countries that are going to partner with us, Australia, Japan, Mexico, and the United Kingdom at the top of the list, are going to see things more or less the same way. They have privileged access to Washington. They don't see the need to share that. At the risk of like freaking out Americans, uh, <laughs> there are a number of cultures where bugs are just part of the diet, and some of them are industrialized. Mm -hmm. Like the Koreans love grasshoppers. Uh, I've had them. I can't say that I enjoyed the experience, <laughs> um, but I think we've all traveled enough to have food that kind of scratches the itch or food that absolutely does not scratch the itch. Uh, Bug production is just animal protein by another name. And I would argue it's not any more environmentally friendly than most of our animal protein production. So I think, I think, I think, I think, because I have not spent a lot of time thinking about bugs, <laughs> uh, that the argument is that because it uses a different input stream, that if we have a catastrophic failure in some other input stream, then we have a backup protein source. I don't think it's anything more sophisticated than that. And, you know, that, and that's logical from my point of view. That doesn't mean I'm going to start eating Korean grasshoppers. And th this is a conversation that we're all going to be having in a few years. 80% of the world's foodstuffs are produced with imported inputs. And if you break down the input stream, you have a choice between either finding something else that is more appropriate to the inputs you can access or not eating. Now, in the United States, we're going to be fine because we're actually the source of not just the single largest chunk of agricultural production in the world. We're the source of a lot of the inputs, too. So we are not going to have to wrestle with this overly. But a lot of the rest of the world, this is going to be part of their new normal. <laughs> you know, you guys, with your historical approach to things, and based on a lot of your questions, you might look like my third book, Disunited Nations. Mm -hmm. Because whereas end of the world goes through all the economic sectors and how we shape our world the way we do and where it's taking us, Disunited Nations does that for 11 countries, uh, six of which are the ones that we like know are going to be the global leaders, but really aren't, and five of which are the ones that are going to rise to the top. And just like with End of the World, it starts at the very beginning. Mm. So in, in its defense, it was designed for that. It was designed to be a talk shop where no one got along to encourage them to argue so that they don't argue on the battlefield. And in that, it has been moderately successful. Where is it the league? So, yeah, I mean, the, the difference between the interwar period and the Cold War period is that the United States decided to lead in the Cold War period, whereas mm -hmm. with World War One, we stepped in, we helped finish the war, but then rather mm -hmm. than build a structure that would prevent the factors that created the war from reasserting themselves, we left, which guaranteed that those factors reinserted themselves. Right. And we got ourselves in another war. Now, looking forward, us backing away from the world, in my opinion, is strategically unwise because it will guarantee the creation of regional powers that will eventually challenge American interests. And we will have to do this all over again. But the people who believe my way, that engagement is the way you improve the human condition and ultimately guarantee American security, we have lost every presidential election seven times in a row. And this last one, we didn't even have somebody on the ticket. Uh, so Americans, for the moment, do not agree with me, and that is taking us in the direction of the book.